one into the sun. It's nice to have a clean windshield. We will be going into the sun today. We are going to visit the mayor at his meeting to update the community at Barnes and Noble this morning. And I have submitted some questions regarding the steel mill. Whenever as yes. Everything I need. A little coffee. Uh, 2,076 miles. I've got. This will be about 10 miles round trip out to Barnes and Noble and back. Five miles. I should be able to make it. Somewhere between a half an hour and 45 minutes, I guess. I think it starts at 9 and it's already better than a quarter after, so I gotta really hurry. And I gotta keep myself on track here. It's Friday. Happy Friday. Oh, thank God it's Friday. Thank God for everything. Oh God, please be with us. Please God, thank you for being with us. Help us, Lord. Please God. I submitted three questions for the mayor for this meeting about the steel mill. I asked him if he had inquired of Everaz about Pueblo purchasing the mill. I've already talked to this subject with him over and over through the years, so hopefully he won't play too stupid and say, oh, it never occurred to me. <laughs> people are anyway I've been hitting him hard on it he can't he doesn't really have an excuse and he really won't have after today I asked him if he asked the Evraz about Pueblo purchasing the mill and what was their reply that was the first question follow-up 
second question. Why isn't Everaz listed as the owners in the lawsuits that are pending over the rail mill shortfalls? Over 300 million in shortfalls, and the rail mill is supposed to be done, and it's the way I understand it, it's not even half done. In the lawsuits, it lists Palmer LLC, Palmer North America, whatever they want to call it, as the owners in the lawsuit. So they own the mill, not ever as. That brings up question three. What happened to the 15 million, at least, that we gave to Palmer back in 2018? Petco gave, you know, we gave, but Petco gave our money to Palmer, and now Palmer owns the mill. How did that happen? And if we paid for it, Pueblo paid for it, why doesn't Pueblo own it? You know what I mean? And here's the bottom line. This nation has to have that rail mill. We need it now. The rail infrastructure has gone to gone to hell. We've got derailments every day, all over the nation. This nation needs that rail mill now. And the other thing, is we've got to stop this war. Making war with the Russians, especially Pueblo. After the Russian company Ebraz in Russia blessed us, they bailed us out. Hundreds of millions of dollars invested in us and our steel mill. And we turn around and try and steal the steel mill from them and kill them in war. Boy, we got it coming. You know what I mean? Somebody blesses you, and you turn around and you steal from them, and then try and murder them and their children, and their people. What the fuck? I mean, I'm serious, what the fuck? mayor have an opportunity, a once in eternity opportunity to save the world, to stop this war and save the world. All we got to do is do the right thing, have the brains and the heart and the balls, the courage to do the right thing 
bow down and repent this war. The Russians are not our enemies. And the Russians' enemies, our, 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 those are our enemies. We need to take that steel mill. We need to help, we need to help Russia and Russia will help us. And that's the thing, see. As this war that we, our nation, is perpetrating on Russia, we are the warmongers, make no mistake. We have pushed this all the way for the last at least 40, 50, 60 years. Non-stop. Push, push, push. Push, push, push. Our nation is the ones that are doing this war. friends. Pueblo, the home of heroes, needs to realize who their friends are and who their enemies are. A friend of my friend is my friend. The enemy of my friend is my enemy. stop this war, we can save the world, and yeah, we're going to pay for it, we'll be insurgents in our own nation, we'll destabilize the whole goddamn thing, but I'm here to tell you that if somebody don't destabilize it, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, the whole thing, the whole works, and there is nothing else, there is nowhere else to go, there is nothing else, everybody believing in other heavens and other hells, it just allows you to destroy the earth. This is heaven. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, here and now. You touch it with your hand. See there, I touched you. I touched you with my hand. It's here and now. Today. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Now. Here and now. Fantasies, sales pitches, trying to sell you something. Mansions, golden streets, pearly gates. Oh, it's so wonderful. War is so awful. Burning hell, eternal torment. All they want is to sell you something and control you to get you to do something that you would not normally do. That's what lies are for. If you knew the truth that there is only one earth, one heaven, one life, one universe, one God. If you knew that truth that every government and every science and every religion and every single institution of man throughout history has denied because they've got to control you, they've got to sell you something. They've got to tell you there's a better place, a worse place, a different dimension, a different reality, a different realm, some other place. That allows you to destroy this one and do things that are stupid beyond belief. The truth is it is here and now. You can touch it with your hand. You can hear it with your ears. You can see it with your eyes. You can taste it. You can feel it. Sense it with your heart. God, the one God, straight down below us in the center, where God should be, in the center of heaven. Where God has to be in order to make heaven work. God gave up everything for this reality, for this one life, this one heaven, this one earth, this one hell, this one thing. And everybody here just wants to look for somewhere else to go. It's not good enough for them. It's like slapping God in the face and saying, your beautiful creation isn't worth a shit. We want, we just, we just can't stand it. And we can't wait to get somewhere else and go somewhere else. Get away from you. Rejection. All of you reject God in the center. All of you who look upward in your pride, 
your arrogance because you will not bow you will not be seen bowing because you are too proud yeah I'm talking to you you know I'm talking to you all of you and myself too time to wake up smell the coffee do the right thing stop the war Stop all war. You and your fantasies, your movies, your books. Science is all deeply rooted in the destruction of everything. Of all God's creation in all of his forms. That's all you're about. Isn't that sad? Don't you think that's sad? Goddamn crying shame, literally. Shame, shame. I'm gonna go this way. I could go down the highway, but I don't know. You gotta follow your guts. I'm gonna go out this way. I don't know that it makes a lot of difference. I've already gone two miles. About halfway there is the bird flies, I guess. Okay, when turn signals on, good. I hate it when I leave the turn signals on, it makes me feel like an idiot. Going down the road, everybody looking, bing, 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 that light going on. Bing, bing, bing. Like, what's he doing? He's an idiot. <laughs> Doesn't know how to turn off his turn signal. Anyway, we have an opportunity, and that's why I'm out here today to do my part again, try and stop this thing, try and make some good out of it. I repent, God. I, I, your will be done, God. That's the bottom line. If this is all your will, there's nothing I can do anyway, and I'm struggling in just my folly. It's my folly. And I enjoy my folly, God, I do. Thank you for my folly. Thank you for everything, God. But I must struggle against this, and I pray that it's not your will. I pray that your will will hear my will, God. God, if you will be done. That's the bottom line. But I have my will too. And I pray that my will is your will. And vice versa. I pray that we're one. Struggle for the same thing. Eternal life. Not eternal death. That's the thing, though. In all of these versions of heaven, huh, they got all the same problems we got here. People can't wait for their big meals. All of them dead animals. So heaven has dead animals, too. You have to kill and eat animals. Horrible, nasty deaths. So that you can drink their blood and eat their flesh. <laughs> and yet this one isn't good enough, but you look forward to something like that. What is it with this earth that's not good enough for you? What is it about this earth that's not beautiful enough for you? What is it about this earth that isn't scary enough for you? What is it? Why do you want to go somewhere else? Why do you hate this place so much? <laughs> you turn it into a prison. It was not meant to be that. It's meant to be a birthing area for us to become what, what we have to become.
alone in the darkness. And there is one God and only one. We've got to face up to that. We can't allow it to shatter our will, shatter our consciousness. We've got to let it allow it to bring us together become one and become what we're meant to be. Whatever that is. Do you understand me? Do you hear me? Just thinking about all this stuff all night messed me up. This morning I had my morning sickness. That's what it's like trying to save the world. It ain't easy. All on your own. All on my own. green lights. Oh my god. milk on the way home. Brought my cooler. Where the hell am I at? Oh, this is Walmart. Sam's Club? Is that what this is? Oh, dang it, how'd I do that? I got off too early there. Again, I always get lost when I need to be somewhere. Ah. The fate of the world hangs in the balance. Gosh, damn it. <sighs> Shit hurts. I'm going high speed here. Almost 20 miles an hour. 
you gotta be careful. <laughs> gotta keep all three wheels on the ground here. Okay, turn signals on already. <laughs> okay, good, I guess. All right, turn signal still on, that's good. All right, let's go. We gotta get down the road. I took the wrong turn again. Ay, ay, ay. in the sun. Let's see what time it is. Oh my goodness. time is there? 8.46, perfect. We barely made it. Okay. Okay. That's right, I gotta start. There's the, the mirror. There he is. Okay. Stop the recording here. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see uh, some people here. I know we probably have some Barnes and Nobles regulars here today, but I want to uh, I want to uh, thank Barnes and Noble. We're doing community connections today, June second, twenty twenty three, from Barnes and Noble. Um, they've opened up uh, for us particularly for this, so we have some people here. The way we operate these community connections is that, uh, I need that? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's better? Yeah. All, all right. So uh, the way we do these community connections is I'll start with some opening remarks. Then we'll open it up for questions from people that are in attendance. Feel free to help yourself to some coffee, coffee here at Barnes & Noble this morning. Um, and again, my thanks to Barnes & Noble for making this space available for this monthly meeting um, of the mayor's office. So let me start by talking about something that uh, you just probably read about, uh, zero fare for better air. So for this summer, we're gonna have free, uh, Pueblo Transit has gotten an award from the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies for zero fare for better air. Uh, this initiative will help us reduce the ozone level in the city of Pueblo and the state of Colorado throughout the summer. So it's gonna include the summer months of June, July, and August. It begins Thursday, uh, June, sec June 1st, yesterday, and it's free fares for all throughout the summer months and, um, and includes both Pueblo Transit and City Lift. So that's, uh, that's good news. Pueblo Transit will provide shuttle service to the Care and Share Food Bank for Southern Colorado to the food distribution events on June 28th, 
July 26th and August 23rd at Praise Assembly on Troy Avenue. And they've also partnered with Southern Colorado Equity Alliance for free bus rides to Pueblo Pride on August 20th at Mineral Palace Park. And again, uh, Pueblo Transit will, as they do every year, provide free bus shuttle service for Puebloans and for our out-of-town visitors from downtown Pueblo from August 25th to August 31st at the Colorado State Fair. So we just completed in the city of Pueblo our uh, spring team up to clean up effort. We hosted this uh, twice weekly event on uh, Saturday, May 6th. More than 600 cars uh, came through the Colorado State Fairgrounds from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. We had volunteers from Public Works, Code Enforcement, Parks and Rec, and over 60 uh, roll-offs were utilized and over 30 vouchers for the Southside Landfill were handed out to alleviate uh, financial burden for people that couldn't um, get through because the lines were so long. So in addition to this, um, this cleanup effort, the City of Pueblo partnered with Waste Connections for discount days from May 8th through May 20th for a 50% discount on the, at the Southside Landfill to help residents um, with the financial stress of trash removal and cleanup. You might have noticed that uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation, CDOT, came out on May 23rd to clean up I, the I-25 corridor along, uh, along the interstate that passes through town. A lot of you don't know that that's a CDOT right-of-way and the maintenance of that right-of-way for cleanup and for grass uh, cutting and uh, tree trimming is the responsibility of CDOT, but uh, we, our Public Works Department partnered with them that day to help clean up debris and trash along the roadway to assist in beautifying our city a little bit during this beginning of the tourist season. You know, even though it's CDOT's responsibility, it's our city and we get blamed for it if it looks, looks terrible. So it was great that CDOT uh, took that, that on. I want to let you know that there's a Brownfields public meeting taking place on Tuesday, June 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. at the Pueblo uh, Rawlings Library in the Thurston Room. Uh, you'll learn about updates of the uh, Brownfields Master Plan with the Pueblo Planning and Community Development Department and the EPA. Just recently, the uh, city was informed that the EPA granted uh, $1 million to rehab the old Keating Junior High School building across from Central High School, and this was a part of a larger announcement of uh, $315 million in um, EPA grounds field funding selections. Um, you know, last week on Monday and Tuesday, I spent two days in Washington, D.C. I'm one of 35 appointed members of the Local Government Advisory Committee for the Environmental Protection Agency. So we spent a couple of days in meetings uh, there talking about uh, the new limitations that the EPA is going to make on PFOS which are these forever chemicals that have been manufactured for about 50 years and it's been recently publicized or disclosed, I guess, by the manufacturers that these chemicals, they last forever. That's why they're called forever chemicals and that they will um, have adverse health consequences for, for citizens. So the EPA is going to announce some pretty stringent uh, testing requirements and um, pretty minimal levels. And in 2020, the Public Board of Waterworks and many other cities in the state of Colorado uh, had PFOS testing and very little PFOS was found in the Pueblo water supply, but we all need to be prepared. PFOS are those chemicals that typically you might have heard about are in firefighting foam. That's where, uh, so a lot of the airports are contaminated and those kind of things, uh, fountain and security had their wells contaminated by the water that came off from Peterson Air Force Base where they tested and used that foam. These manufacturers sort of sold this stuff as harmless and you could use it for training and that kind of stuff. Uh, so they weren't just using it to fight airplane fires, they were using it for training purpose and those kind of things. And as a result of that, there's a lot of it in the environment. But it's also in nonstick pans and it's in hundreds of consumer products. So. Um, there's going to be a big educational effort about, about uh, those chemicals. Um, as I came today, I came up Ridge Drive. I don't know if anybody's been on Ridge Drive, but it's been overlaid this year. Uh, Abriendo has been overlaid this year. 
Um, that was our first really project for this spring. Um, Toy Avenue has been done this year and we're going to have some other improvements as well to our street system including Northern Avenue, Cleveland Avenue, Goodnight Avenue, Joplin Avenue, Jones Avenue, Dillon Drive. If you came in today you see they're working on the intersections here at Dillon Drive getting the uh, corners ready uh, for paving. They all have to be made handicap accessible um, if when we come in and overlay them so that will, Dillon Drive will be done later this summer. And um, Prairie Avenue, much anticipated repair of Prairie Avenue is coming this year. Uh, I just signed a contract a couple of days ago for the, the uh, paving overlay that's gonna be done there. That probably will be done after the State Fair. It'll go from Pueblo Boulevard to Mesa. We obviously don't wanna disrupt the tourists and the visitors to the Colorado State Fair, so that Overlay work will be done on Prairie Avenue after the Colorado State Fair. Today, uh, Friday, June 2nd, the uh, El Centro del Quinto Sol Summer Kickoff Barbecue is taking place from 12 to 2 p.m. So if you're available and want to go by there, uh, you can go by and get a hot dog while the supplies last. The rides at City Park are open, and they're expanded hours from June 1st through September 4th. Uh, Monday through Wednesday, they're closed. Thursday and Friday, they're open from 5 to 9 p.m. Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 9 p.m. And this year, we're selling $5 wristbands for unlimited rides for, for that day. And all rides are still 25 cents a ticket. Um, Books in the Park is back at Bradford Park Pavilion Monday, through, Monday, and, Monday and Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And at the Vinewood Park Pavilion from, on Thursdays and Fridays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Pueblo District 60 is providing free lunches at those uh, Books in the Park uh, events from 1030 to 1050 for children 18 years old and younger uh, this summer. So additional programming by the Parks Department for the summer includes tennis lessons, swim lessons, pickleball, adult softball, summer basketball at the slabs, movies in the park, and more. And you can stay up to date on all those events from the Parks Department. They're really trying to make the recreation program here more robust as we come out of COVID um, and people are getting out and around. Uh, you can stay informed on the city's website at www.pueblo.us or follow the Parks and Recreation Department on their Facebook and Instagram. And just uh, that you know, the hard work of the City of Pueblo is done a lot by our advisory boards and commissions. These are volunteer positions and we rely on volunteers from the community to help us operate the city. So we have current vacancies on the ADA Advisory Committee, the Community Services Advisory Commission, and that's a commission in connection with Pueblo County that basically allocates about a million dollars in funds to various nonprofits uh, in our community. So if you have an interest in that, that's a good one to be on. We have openings on the Pueblo Energy Advisory Commission and the Streetscape Advisory Committee. Um, also have openings on the Marijuana Licensing Board. The deadline for that is June 7th, 2023. The deadline for the Liquor and Beer Licensing Board vacancy is June 19th, 2023. And the deadline for the Honor Farm Enterprise Citizens Advisory Board is June 19th, 2023. Uh, next week, um, Myself and Councilor Larry Atencio and Deputy Chief Garcia and other representatives of the Pueblo Police Department will be traveling to our sister city of Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, we're going to be touring their industries and signing a renewal of our sister cities agreement down there. So I'm looking forward to that. Last week I had the opportunity to tour uh, GCC Cement, which I had forgotten started in Chihuahua, Mexico. So we've got a terrific plant here that employs about 100 people and it really started in, in Chihuahua. So there's some things that we're interested in seeing in Chihuahua. Um, and before I conclude my remarks, I wanna thank you all for coming today, but remind you that our next Mayor's Community Connection is gonna take place Friday, July 7th at 9 a.m. at Fuel and Iron at 400 South Union Avenue. If you haven't been there, that's, uh, that's a terrific venue and we're looking forward to having a community connections there at that venue. 
Uh, they usually don't open till later, but Solar Roast is open in the morning there, so you'll be able to get some coffee and we'll have a good conversation with people. So um, I want to open it up for questions, but I know, Haley, we got at least one question uh, on the internet before, uh, before we started this morning. So would you be kind enough to read that? And we'll try to answer that. You need the microphone. Have you talked to Evraz about Pueblo buying the Pueblo Steel Mill? And if so, what was their reply? Yeah. So I have had numerous conversations with uh, uh, the representatives of Evraz, not specifically about Pueblo buying the Pueblo Steel Mill. They opened that process up, ooh, maybe eight or nine months ago after the war in Ukraine started, and they decided they wanted to separate from the the Russian oligarchs, but I met uh, earlier this week with uh, the current president here of the local plant, and uh, who's unfortunately going to be leaving, and uh, the person that's going to be temporarily here, um, uh, talking about the operations at the Pueblo plant. And I know there's some there's been some discussion about can the employees or can the city of Pueblo purchase you know that steel making plant. Um, Obviously, that plant's been in existence for 150 years, and throughout that entire time, it's been in private ownership. So I really don't see a path forward to the government or the city owning that. Whether the employees could uh, put that together or not, I think that would be an arduous process. And my understanding is that they have narrowed down their potential buyers to a couple, uh, and that they're working through the regulatory process in the United Kingdom which is where Everaz um, is incorporated, where it's traded on the stock exchange. And the problems they're having are that the United Kingdom has placed sanctions on those Russian oligarchs that own the majority of shares in Everaz. So I think the government in the United Kingdom thinks that um, if they're gonna be proceeds from the sale of this, that they should um, be able to acquire some of that. So that slowed down this purchase uh, and the sale transaction for a little while, but I'm confident it's gonna go through. Uh, they told me when I met with them earlier this week, they got about 400 people working on the construction site right now, that uh, they've got a local general contractor that's helping them out, but that project is probably gonna be, be completed by Everaz, becoming their own general contractor. It's far enough along that they'll be able to, to do that. Um, you all know that they had a problem with their original general contractor who couldn't meet the timelines and boards and getting things done like, like they wanted. So they decided to terminate that and move forward without that general contractor. So, um, but that's still a work in progress, but uh, I'm confident that they're gonna continue that operation and be able to get it completed. Probably not as quickly as they would have liked, but the, uh, the weld, the new weld shop is only months away from being able to open and they're testing it right now. So they're actually doing welds in that new weld shop right now that's part of this mill expansion. And it's expected that in just a couple of months, actually the rails that are welded will be shipped out from that, that new weld shop. So that project is uh, continuing on. Any other questions? Another question is, what happened to the 15 million given to Palmer LLC in 2018 by Petco? Why does Pueblo pay Palmer to own the steel mill, and why does Pueblo not own it if we pay for it? Yeah, yeah. So the 15 million dollars in half cent sales tax money um, was used to do part of the environmental cleanup um, on the site where the new rail mill is being constructed. Um, that's what came out of the half cent sales tax fund. But in addition to that, um, Urban Renewal paid about $75 million for that environmental cleanup. So the citizens are really in for 80 or 90 or $95 million uh, on that project. All of that money was used for environmental cleanup so that that land that was there could be used for this new rail mill. Um, they hauled a lot of dirt out of there to the dump, to the south side landfill. Um, and that money simply was to reimburse Everaz for, for those expenses that, uh, 
that they incurred in in that effort. So in, so there won't be any ongoing payments, although Everaz will be getting um, payments from Urban Renewal for the, for the foreseeable future uh, to help retire some bonds. The, the Urban Renewal borrowed some bonds to help with this cleanup effort, and those bonds are going to be paid off out of the real estate property taxes that Everaz pays once that new mill is up and operational. So that's how the bonds that finance that cleanup will be paid off. And probably that project's going to total, I think it started out at 500 million. The last estimates I saw were it's probably going to be around 700 million is what the cost of that is. So if the citizens are in for 100, we're in for a relatively small part, although 100 million dollars is a lot of money. One more. Okay, this is a two-part question uh, from our friend Elvis Martinez on Facebook. What are your predictions in the NBA Finals, and how many games will it take for either team to win? <laughs> then secondly, will the library youth reading program continue this year for the kids to receive $100 for reading? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, the $100 reading program will not continue this year. Some are reading in the parks, and the library will have their own reading program, but it will not be uh, what it was in previous years in terms of uh, the city and county paying children there to read uh, $100. So ever the sports fanatic, Elvis is interested in that. Uh, I predict that the Nuggets are going to win. Based on last night's game, they look pretty strong. Um, I hope they don't win in four games because I'll be in Chihuahua for game four and I'd like to be home and able to watch it from the comfort of my living room when that final game takes place. So uh, I'm hoping they don't sweep them, but who can complain if they do, right? All right, is that the questions from the internet? All right, anybody ha locally have any questions here? Heather? Yeah. I, uh, let me give you the... Um, that was all great reported to us and that was moving forward and I appreciate hearing all about that. Um, but I just wanted to bring up that I am a member on um, Facebook of a group called Helping Pueblo. Called what? Helping Pueblo. Okay. And recently there were so many posts of people um, just having outrageous Black Hills energy bills. I mean, this one guy posted about, I think his bill was $1,800 or $1,200. And he asked if anybody else, that was a monthly bill. And he asked if anybody else was getting a bills of that nature. And um, sure enough, boy, I think there were 73 comments on this whole uh, topic. and. One guy said he had a, his mother had an $800 bill when uh, she doesn't have any electricity in the winter other than running lights, that they heat the house with a wood stove and they, um, they have a propane tank or I don't know, the refrigerator or something. And uh, everyone was going, well, we got notification that there were going to be uh, increases in Black Hills rates. Well, these are just off the charts, and yeah. these poor people are calling into the customer service, and those that answer the phone just aren't that interested. They'll tell them, you got to pay it, you said it was going to go up. They don't give them any options of where to turn and what to do, and a lot of these things sound completely out of whack. Yeah. And if, if it's Black Hills Energy raising rates and going to the PUC, and we don't have any representation there uh, other than citizens writing complaints in. It's, it's intimidating when you pull it up to go on. <coughs> I can't imagine, you know, people that are lower income, even middle income, getting online. It, it's intimidating to put your comments in there. Yeah. And I don't know that they get enough comments from Pueblo, and they've got a monopoly here. Right. So I think Pueblo needs to be involved in these PUC hearings and send somebody with knowledge to that. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, we have been involved in the uh, rate cases that Black Hills Energies has filed. I mean, the city of Pueblo has retained a law firm in Denver that represents us in the um, renewable energy stuff they file in the rate cases that they file. 
So we are active participants in that. Uh, yeah, what you've reported here just seems unbelievable to me. We have a high electric electricity bill at our house. And part of the increase, I think, is because Black Hills has been now able to recover. I can't remember whether it was last year or the year before when we had that brutally cold, cold spell. And they had to go out and buy natural gas. And at that time, the natural gas market was out of control. And they, the Public Utilities Commission has allowed them to recover part of the cost of that. But $1,800 a month for a household electric bill just seems outrageous. It sounds like a mistake was made to me. Um, you know, I certainly, I think they're doing the right thing to report it to the Public Utilities Commission because uh, that's just unbelievable. As high as ours are, they're not nearly that high. So, yeah, but rest assured the city participates in that. And as you know, in 2020, um, we had an opportunity as a community to move away from this investor-owned utility system that Black Hills has to a municipally-owned utility system. And I was convinced that that would be the best bang for the buck for the ratepayers in the city of Pueblo, but uh, the city voters overwhelmingly rejected that. So um, we are where we are, and we obviously have to pay attention. We have to um, monitor those uh, filings that uh, Black Hills makes with the Public Utilities Commission. But sounds like some of these at least might just be a a mistake. Somebody entered the wrong number in a computer. I mean, there's. I'm not sure what other explanation there could be for it. Yeah. Yeah, it is shocking. Other questions? Oh, I'm not sure I should call on Jan, but I will. We are in the uh, final stages of the design of the Union and Main transformation. Uh, the plan is to reduce Union Avenue to one lane in each direction and to widen the sidewalks there, make Union Avenue much more pedestrian friendly, try to move some of that traffic off of Union Avenue onto uh, Main Street that's there. There'll be a stop sign, at least the last plans I saw, there'd be a stop sign at each uh, intersection on Union Avenue to slow that traffic way down so that bicyclists could feel safe traversing Union Avenue. Um, that's going to be funded by a, a, a combination of things. The city's putting in about $4 million. Pueblo County's putting in about $3 million from the 1A funds. Uh, Colorado Department of Transportation has put in about $2 million. So those plans are about finalized. We just amended the contract for the design firm for design of some lighting down there because we want to make sure that there can be event lighting if you will and that the light poles that we have down there will accommodate those banners and things like that to announce events there so they're designing those things but i expect that uh, construction will start on that later this year on union and maine so it'll it'll be a while we want to try not to interfere with the chile and Frijoli festival that uh, utilizes union avenue but there will be some changes that'll have to be made to that festival in future years because we're going to narrow that street uh, down considerably there. So um, that's that's going to happen very quickly. And I think the uh, design firm and the city of Pueblo have made a lot of efforts to involve the business community on Maine. I've participated in uh, town halls and forums with with those business owners and with the design firm so that they're getting input from as many people as possible about this, but those plans are just about to be finalized and we expect that it'll be moving forward uh, later in September. Jim, do you have a question? No. Jim Network, I do have a comment about the high rates of electricity. I saw that comment. I changed and I don't know if you can reduce your monthly bill 
down to an awful little thing. Okay? And my electric bill per month for electricity is the things are not in your seats, ten dollars seventy-seven cents. Okay? You can see it's free. You can write this off as a pass. Write up. Check with the CPUs. Okay? And it's the reason the purple could not be in Solar City. The energy that strikes our globe in one 24 hour day will hold the world if we could store all that energy for anything more we could get. And why do you see 300 billion years? Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim, for those comments. Uh, yeah, well, that's obviously going to be important as we move forward and try to uh, move away from fossil fuels that, uh, you know, Pueblo is ideally situated for uh, the generation of electricity via solar fields. And the city and other the housing authority has made some of those solar farms. Periodically, Black Hills will uh, uh, send out a request for proposals to build a solar farm, which is basically people that maybe can't afford to put solar on their house. They can participate in this solar farm um, and sign up for the energy from that solar farm and sort of be guaranteed a rate. The nice thing about solar is that, you know, once that solar field is in, you don't have to worry about the price of coal or the price of gas uh, going up because that's it's there. Uh, so that's one of the variables you don't have to worry about. That's how Everaz was able to do this plant expansion is because they have a guaranteed energy rate for the next 20 years from public service company because they put the largest behind the meter solar field in North America on Everaz's property. So that's, they have a consistent, they know what their energy is going to cost. And when you're making steel, uh, you know, that's the largest energy consumer in Colorado uh, is uh, Everaz Steel. They use more electricity than any other person any other entity. So if they can guarantee what the cost of that is over the next 20 years, um, that's spectacular for them. And that's one of the reasons they made the decision to build that solar, that power, that uh, long rail mill here rather than somewhere else. So, uh, but there are opportunities for people who, if they can't uh, invest in solar on their roof to participate in programs uh, with Black Hills Energy to, uh, be a member of these uh, solar gardens that uh, they build from time to time. Other questions or things that people would like to hear about or talk about? Yes, sir. When will Prairie be Ah, here's somebody that was late getting here, wanted to know when will Prairie be paved? We talked about that earlier. Prairie is going to be paved uh, after the Colorado State Fair, probably first couple of three weeks in September. I explained to the group that I uh, just signed the contract for the asphalt improvements to Prairie Avenue uh, a couple of weeks ago signed for the um, concrete improvements. Uh, you probably know that as when we go over an overlay we have to make sure all the curbs all the corners are handicap accessible so you'll see that work start here in the next few weeks but the actual overlaying of Prairie Avenue will probably take place after the Colorado State Fair because it's going to be from uh, Pueblo Boulevard to Mesa Avenue and we don't want to interfere with our visitors and tourists at the fair. So this year it's going to be paved. Yes, Heather. Um, can I make another comment about paving? Um, I don't know if how roads got determined what needed to be overlaid and paved, but I was doing some tutoring down at Irving, uh, and I would come from Highway 50 West and broke down on uh, Baltimore, cut over on 29th, and then go on Cheyenne. And that road is so bumpy, it was unbelievable. And I had to quit driving on it, it just was killing me to go down that road uh, just to get to Irving. And then, so I started driving on Denver Boulevard, which is one street. Uh, to the west of uh, Cheyenne, and I just wanted to mention that I don't know again how things get to determined to be paid. But I think they said a section of Cheyenne was going to be done. I'm not sure 
but not that section, going to urban. Okay. And I feel sorry for the parents that go that way. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I think this is one that is at the top of Elvis's list, if I recall. He's always wondering about Cheyenne Avenue when it's going to be paved. Let me tell you how, uh, how the determination is made of what roads to start on. About a year ago, we uh, hired a company to drive every paved road in the city of Pueblo with equipment that has sonar on it, lasers on it, and they generated a report about the a pavement quality index for every road in the city of Pueblo. And we're using that data now to make that determination about which road should be next on the list. And unfortunately, it's often not the worst roads that should be at the top of the list. It's those roads that if you don't fix them now, they're going to be deteriorate to the point that you're going to have to rebuild them rather than just mill and overlay them. So, they make those determinations. We have some roads that have to be rebuilt and those obviously have to be in the process as well. But what uh, we've done in the last two years is we've committed at least $10 million a year to repair and overlay of the street system in the city of Pueblo, which is uh, multiple millions more than uh, has been done in the last 10 years. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the graph or not that shows how much money was spent on roads. Uh, and it just dropped to virtually zero in 2018, 2019. When I took office, I made that a commitment because that is the largest complaint we get from the, uh, the voters is the condition of the roads. And so we're starting to get it up again, but I think in the last three years, through the end of 2022, we had overlaid in the last three years, 59 miles, lane miles, 59 lane miles of city streets. So. Um, we're going to continue that. Uh, fortunately, the voters de Bruce the city of Pueblo, so we have some excess TABOR revenues, and the city's financial situation is such right now. In the last four years, our sales tax collections have increased from $50 million to $73 million. So we, we have some money to work with now, and we're going to put a lot of that money to work on rebuilding and repairing our streets. Other questions? We still have some time left, yes. Hi, thank you, Your Honor. Um, my name is Sean Petty, and I, I have a kind of a statement first. Oh. Really? Okay. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Okay. Hello? 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 <laughs> uh, my name is Charlie Petty. I kind of have a statement. I, I'd like to speak out on behalf of the Russians and the Russian company Evraz. I worked with them. I was the president of Local 2102, and um, I was one of the biggest adversaries to Russia owning one of our national steel mills, and I tried to stop it, but I was unsuccessful. That being said, I worked with Evraz, and they were, as far as the owners of the steel mill, and I, my family has over 200 years of service out there. Uh, they were some of the best owners that we ever worked with. They were very generous and they blessed this community, this state. And um, I want to speak out on behalf of them and against this war that our nation is perpetrating against them. Let's be honest. This is a forced sale that they're being forced to sell. It's forced because of this war and it's not right. And we have a chance. Pebble has a once and forever chance stop this war, save the world, and own our own steel mill. If we have the courage and the heart to stand up and talk to the Russians, contact Evraz. I have been in contact with them. I know they would gladly sell Pueblo the mill at a very good price, and they will make sure that we are successful. But it would take us standing up for ourselves and against evil on behalf of good. And that's my statement. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Laura, is there something else we should talk about? Uh, what does Brownsfield's study do? Uh, you mentioned Brownsfield earlier. What does that study help us do in the city for the building? Yeah. 
Well, as you can imagine, Pueblo's been a, uh, a manufacturing city for 150 years. And so we've had smelters here, we've had plants, foundries, all kinds of stuff. When those, and for a lot of that 150 years, uh, the operations of those facilities were not regulated. As a result of that, there's a lot of contamination. So these brownfield studies will allow us to identify those areas that have been contaminated and will allow us to sort of outline what kind of remediation efforts will be needed to make those properties usable again or to make it safe for human humans to uh, occupy. Um, you know that um, Pueblo is a home of a Superfund site with the EPA where the old Colorado smelter was uh, right uh, east of uh, I-25 there north of Northern Avenue. Um, and, and those neighborhoods, those three neighborhoods have been you know, getting free testing and free remediation. I think the deadline for getting free testing is passed. I think it was the 26th of May. But if you live in that area, have property in that area, and your property has not been remediated, now is the time to reach out to the EPA and get that property remediated. Because if you do not do that, the remediation of that property will be on your back in the future. And at the end of this cleanup process, there's going to be a, uh, some institutional controls imposed by the city of Pueblo on that property, which basically says if your property hasn't been tested and hasn't been cleaned up. If you want to get a building permit to do something on that property, you have to get it tested. And if it's contaminated, you have to get it cleaned up. So that's going to add thousands of dollars to any project in that area that people want to do when they could get it done for free right now. So we had a town hall meeting last week, uh, a telephone town hall with the residents in that area, encouraging them to do that as well. There's not many left, but um, there are going to be some consequences for people who don't get tested and who don't get cleaned up because it's going to be a problem for them and their property in the future. So, um, but this ground, Brownsfield grant, and we, we have a Brownsfield grant now that allows us to test, do some of the testing, environmental testing on properties downtown, and we can use part of that money to remediate it as well. We've had that grant for a couple of years, and we've used it to help developers uh, test their property and begin preliminary remediation efforts. So those are important things that uh, the federal government is making available to us to help with that. What else? Yes, Council President Heather Graham is with us today. Let me. Can you talk a little bit about what the city is doing to incentivize the police and how we're moving forward with what's coming up Monday? Yeah, you all know that uh, Pueblo, Colorado, the United States has had a hard time uh, getting people to be police officers and getting people to stay as police officers owing to the events that have taken place over the last couple of years. Pueblo is no exception. We're about 50 police officers short and we've been talking about how can we get that turned around. Um, what is it going to take to do that? And we're operating and trying to attack this problem from several different perspectives. Um, we, we have a recruitment problem, really, and it's the younger police officers who leave the police department after they've been here, um, you know, four or five years. We train them and they leave to go somewhere else. Some of them leave for more money. Some of them leave because of family circumstances. You know, they want to go to another state to live, which is where their family lives, or another town to live. And there's not much we can probably do about any of those kind of reasons for people wanting to leave Pueblo and go to work somewhere else. But to the extent that people are leaving Pueblo because they're not getting paid enough, uh, in the last 12 months, council is going to consider a, an amendment to the collective bargaining agreement for the police officers union uh, next week that will uh, start every new officer at step three, which is basically an $800 increase over what they were getting before. And that's on top of our increasing the starting salary of a police officer by $500 earlier. So in the last 12 months, we've increased the starting pay for a patrol officer in the city of Pueblo by 28%. Uh, 
Um, we're hoping that that'll make a difference in our recruitments. Um, you know, we have a, an academy that started in June, just a couple of days ago, that we got seven officers in. You know, out of 135 applicants, seven of them end up enrolling. We've got another academy starting in October. Um, and I had breakfast with the chief before this meeting to talk about that and other issues at the police department. And I think we have 36 candidates who have survived the initial interview. So now they'll go through background checks and um, psychological testing, and we'll see how many end up in that academy in October. So it takes a long time because we don't want anybody just carrying a gun and uh, being Wyatt Earp. You know, we want to make sure that the people that we're putting on the streets and giving them that authority um, are as sound as possible so that we can avoid the kind of situations that have happened in other communities around the country where you get rogue officers and, you know, things get out of hand very quickly. So we're pretty careful about who we hire. But the answer to fighting crime is we've got to have more police officers on the street. And in Pueblo right now, it's not a question of money. The citizens renewed the public safety tax that 0.2% tax that we can use to hire additional officers. So we have the money to do it. What we don't have is people that are interested in doing it. So we've got to sort of change the mentality a little bit, try to attract some different people. We're out recruiting all over the country. We're recruiting at Fort Carson, trying to get soldiers who are about to muster out to uh, you know, see if they're interested in doing that. So we've really stepped up our recruitment efforts. Um, and we're hoping you know, this additional money uh, will will help attract uh, candidates um, to the city of Pueblo. Um, we'll find out whether money is the motivating factor. You know, part of what I would like to do is make Pueblo the blessed police department in the state of Colorado for people to work in. And it's already a police department where you get experiences here like you don't get in any other, any other police department in the state of Colorado. So if you can make it through uh, being a police officer for the city of Pueblo, you know, you, you've done something. So we want to make it an elite police department uh, and people will have skills here that they couldn't acquire anywhere else. And we're hoping that that will help attract people who want to be police officers here. I mean, they have a lot to deal with. Um, but um, so those are the kind of efforts we're making right now. We're going to develop a quartermaster system as soon as we can get that done for public bid so that um, we'll provide all of the uh, uniforms for officers now. Now we give them, I think, $600 a year for a uniform allowance, but we'll just allow them to, uh, we'll provide the uniform to them or allow them to purchase it on a credit card, basically. Um, and that uniform allowance will be used to maintain it. So we're making a big effort because, as I say, that's the answer to driving our crime rate down is um, more police officers on the street doing more proactive policing. This summer, uh, you know, the chief told me this morning we have nine school resource officers that during the school year they're in the schools, not out on the street. Summertime now, schools are out, so they'll be out on the street. So that will add to the patrols uh, in the city in the summer. So you'll see hopefully a, a larger police presence out there this summer. And that's when, unfortunately, some activities pick up in the city because kids are out later at night. They don't have school to worry about. And, you know, um, not many good things happen to kids after after midnight in the city of Pueblo when you're out running around with your buddies. So um, we'll have a few additional officers at least uh, out on the streets of this summer. In addition to that, we're going to fund uh, and the Boys and Girls Club is going to start a camp for teens um, Friday and Saturday nights at El Centro Quinto de Sol on the east side from I think 5 o'clock till 1130 at night for teenagers, so it gives them a place to go. One of the complaints we get is there's nothing for teenagers to do. So this will be a place for them to gather in a controlled setting and only only teens of high school age, uh, no, no high school graduates, uh, just teens of high school age will be allowed to participate in this program. But we're hoping that that will, will make a difference. You're probably as dismayed as I am about the gun violence that we see in the city of Pueblo. And the fact that we got 14 year old kids carrying around guns, shooting people uh, and getting arrested for first degree murder. You know, that kind of stuff is insane. And it's pretty hard for the city to be able to do something immediately about that, except arrest them and try to get them 
through the criminal justice system. But on the long term, we've gotten some grants from Bloomberg Philanthropies where we're working on programs in the middle schools where some of these kids are making decisions that they're going to join gangs and trying to get them diverted from that. So we've had an after school program. We're going to have a summer program in connection with District 60 that will be tailored towards those kids on the bubble, if you will. Uh, and the school district has identified them and we've put together a program. We're working with them to try to show them some alternatives and try to keep them from making those kind of decisions that will drastically affect the rest of their lives and will drastically affect our communities. So we're working on that, but those are long-term solutions and those things have to be put in place, but um, you know, it requires the entire community to cooperate to make a difference there, including parents have to be much more strict, grandparents have to be much more strict about where the kids take in the car uh, after dark and you know, they just need to pay more attention to that. So what else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, here, let me, let me give you the microphone. Um, I have a question I have, and I don't know if this has been discussed yet, is that I feel like sometimes I'm being a uh, health foster team at home because of my, I'm a senior citizen, and there's, you know, like so many homeless people that pop out of places. I used to come here every in the summer, in the evening, and uh, have a uh, cup of uh, cold tea, ice tea, just look browse on the books. I haven't done that now because uh, I'm fearful of coming over here. Uh, you know, and it used to be safe. I would, I mean, I would park and I could just, but now we would go shopping. I don't go anywhere after dark. I mean, that's terrible. Uh, and, and then you find, you find the close, I mean, I live, or, I live in uh, the Eagle Ridge area. And that used to really give, say, I used to walk to my home to Alderson in the evening. Now you never know, but you know, it's just not safe. What are we going to do about that? And I know we've had homeless all along. I mean, they have been. But they were like an established people. I mean, we knew who they were. And, and now they're so, um, no safety in our own, in, in this community. And I've lived here all my life, and I have five children, and they're all, they're all in law enforcement. So I know what's going on, and, and uh, you know, like that, that police officer that was, was shot at, you know, and I have friends that are, the same thing. They're, t they're telling us when we get together, it's, you know, it's dangerous to even be in a, in a police officer because they shoot at you and you don't know from where. So what are we going to do? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. You raised one of obviously the more difficult questions we have is um, the question of the homeless in our community. And I think we all need to start from the premise that it's not a crime to be homeless. Now, you, you, uh, you can't commit crimes if you're homeless, uh, but the number of crimes committed by the homeless compared to some of the other crimes that are going on is pretty small. Um, the number of crimes committed by the homeless compared to some of the other crimes that are committed is pretty small. Uh, the problem I think we have with the homeless community is that we don't have mental health facilities that are able to help people with their mental illnesses. I mean, we closed the civil commitment beds we had at the Mental Health Institute. Parkview Hospital closed the civil commitment beds, the psychiatric beds that they had at Parkview Hospital. So um, we've made a conscious decision as a society that we're not going to keep these people in the hospital and get them on their medications. As a result of that, The battery, I think, is going on this, so I'll just try to speak loudly. You know, when I talk to uh, the Pueblo Rescue Mission, who has the permanent homeless shelter on... Um, did I turn it off, Haley? Is it on? Test. When I, when I talk... Oh, there we go. When I talk to the uh, rescue mission that has a permanent homeless shelter, 
they tell me that 70% of the clients that stay there are mentally ill. Um, Crazy Faith Ministries, who operated a warming shelter this, uh, uh, this winter, tell me that 100% of the clients that stay there on those bitterly cold nights are mentally ill. So part of the problem of homelessness is these people are not in touch with reality. I mean, I, I don't think anybody in their right mind would want to live the way they're living. Um, but the problem is they're not in the right mind, you know? And it's a shame because some of the medications that are available today, if people would take them on a regular basis, they'd be able to live out in society, they'd be able to maintain homes and households and things like that. So housing, we need additional housing for sure, but we could build all the housing we want, and if people are not in the right mind, it's not gonna make any difference because they'll tear it up, they won't stay there, and they won't be able to keep it. So it's, it's something that has to be addressed. We've had mental health providers and people who work with the homeless in my office, asking them to develop a more robust outreach program that we can go out into the communities. You know, unfortunately in this area, around Fountain Creek, that's where they're, they're staying. That's where they're camping. Um, I had a meeting last week with one of those individuals in my office uh, who came in and sort of wanted permission to be able to stay down there. And I said, well, I'm not gonna give you permission to stay down there, but you know, you're gonna make it a lot easier on yourself and your fellow residents there if, number one, you know who's ripping off these merchants, going and stealing this stuff and bringing it down to the camps. When the police come down there, cooperate with the police and get rid of the bad apples that are down in that neighborhood. Uh, number two, clean up after yourself. We'll try to get some roll-offs down there and you clean this mess up so that you're not living in a pigsty. Uh, he's supposed to get back to me in the next week or so about a plan that uh, he would like to roll out. But um, that's one of the more difficult issues is the homeless people. And I, I think uh, it's driven by mental illness. I think that has to be uh, a, a big part of it. Now there's a certain number of people, it's a pretty small group, that's the lifestyle they want to lead. They don't want to be involved with anybody else. For the most part, they're not committing crimes. But you get these mentally ill people, if they're committing crimes, that's where they're getting their mental health treatment. They get arrested, they get put in jail. That's the only mental health treatment a lot of them are getting. And that's a terrible place for them to get mental health treatment because it's very short term, doesn't get them stabilized. When we had the Mental Health Institute here, you could take somebody out there for 30 days and get them on medication, stabilized on medication so that they got out in the community and they're not out of control. Uh, my experience is most of the homeless people, they want to beg and if you just ignore them, they don't get very aggressive. Some of the mentally ill ones, you know, that's a different story. You just have to sort of avoid them and not engage them, not confront them because most of them just want to be left alone. Um, but um, there's obviously those kind of, uh, there's isolated incidents with that, but I understand your fear and I understand how you feel simply because it's sort of been a change from what has been in the past because there's no place for them to go right now to get mental health treatment. I have one more. Oh, one more question. I'm sorry. You have to tell us your dog's name. Oh, what's your dog's name? Oh, the dog's name is Dawn. 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 The Dawn. Dawn. Um, the other thing is, you know, you mentioned about a lot of the people on the street are mentally ill. But what caused that mental illness? Due to, you know, the, the, due to the uh, drug use or the mishandling or uh, the, the life that they have chose. I, you know, there's times when they will change their way of life. But, I mean, why do other, why are we getting, I mean, I know there's, it seems like we're, we have so many of them here. Yeah, I mean, and they're like, uh, you know, it's, I hate to say this, but uh, it's like a, 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 a pile of ants uh, in the evening or early in the morning that they just kind of see them wandering out with, uh, down the street, you know, with a blanket around them or or, or pushing a, 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 a shopping bag and shopping of cars. I mean, there has to be something. I mean, you, you have to go to the rest to the uh, restaurants. And they're there, you know, and here you are walking. I mean, me, I'm talking for myself. And I'm walking with my food or going in. And I feel so bad here. They, you know, it, it makes my, it makes your heart crazy. And then I know I want to start talking. I mean, it's, it's, 
anyway, another thing is that there was this at Alberston. It was raining. This is and it was when it's snowing or rain. Uh, and this man took his mother out of her wheelchair, put her in the wheelchair, put her out there so she could uh, ask for uh, money. And you know, he wrapped her up in a blanket and had her. But I mean, what? You know, what do you do? I mean, that's how bad they are. I mean, they don't need mental health services. They need a heart, they need compassion, they need purpose. I don't say that. Right. Yeah, I, 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 what caused their mental illness, I don't know, but I think a lot of the alcoholism, maybe a lot of the drug use that you see out there might be people trying to self-medicate themselves because they've got this, uh, these diseases that are not being properly treated. So I, I think uh, a key, uh, and it's only part of the solution, but it's a big part of the solution, is getting them the mental health treatment that, that they need. So. What else? I think we have time for one more question, maybe before uh, we're scheduled to close here. I'll just throw in there how important that steel will to all them problems. You give the people something to do, and that's very healthy. You give them hope, and uh, and the, you know that they can own their own things and take care of their own families. Only with opportunity can we do that. And if you're discouraged and there ain't no hope, and, it, and I know feeding them is good. There's nothing wrong with feeding them, but it's like feeding cats. You get more up. And, that, and that's true. And, uh, so we've got to look at giving them hope. Yeah. All right. I really appreciate everybody showing up today. We had a nice crowd today at Barnes & Noble's. Thanks to Barnes & Noble again for making uh, this space available to us and for the, for the coffee. And a reminder that our next Community Connections will be at 9 o'clock on Friday, July 7th, at the Fuel and Iron at 400 South Union. Thank you all for being here. Okay, looks like the mirror got the hell out of here. I don't blame him. I'm getting the hell out of here too. Before I get attacked, bunch of war mongers. Okay. <laughs> Still wound up. For such a peaceful man, I sure want to get all warrior like. I'm not a soul dyer, but I am a warrior. Shamefully. But dang it, what are you supposed to do? Just let this stuff go? Let them destroy the world? Burn it down! Burn everybody! Nuclear fire! Oh yeah. At least it's fair. Everybody burns. Yeah, except for all them people who make the war down in their bunkers. Cowards, hypocrites, just generally fucked up people. Messing up the kingdom of heaven. My kingdom of heaven. You see? Take a personal responsibility. All the sins here. Like Christ. You gotta bear all the sins of the world, all of them, for all time, all of history and all the future. That's where Christ is at in the center, making all life possible by God's sacrifice. Nothing more biblical than the way I teach it, nothing more true, but everybody, every single person, rejects me and what I have to say. 
every science, every religion, every government, every institution of mankind. I am literally alone in the world, it feels like. I'm the only one who knows the truth that God is in the center. That if you want to find God, you just got to pick up something and drop it. And gravity will show you the way. You see? If you want a miracle, there's your miracle. You take something, you hold it out, let it go. It'll seek God. Be your gravity. That's all you got to do. Nice and simple. No matter what dream or whatever nightmare you wake up in, you want to know where the way out is, pick something up, hold it out, and let it go. Gravity will show you the way. A string helps. thing about it, I'll fight for peace. <laughs> I'll kick your ass, you son of a bitch. You, want, you don't want my peace, I'll give you your peace. You want war? Here's what war is. Let me kick your ass. So you got it. You understand. That's what war is. You're on the exact opposite of the golden rule. Do everything you can that you would never want done to you. That's what you do. That's war. That's how you win war. You become the bad guy. The evil. And war wins. <laughs> well, I pick my battles. And I'll fight for peace. I'll fight for love. I'll fight for justice. I'll fight for the truth. I will not fight for lies. I will not fight for justice. I will not fight for rich fucking cowardly fucking hypocrites to fucking own everybody. And make everybody else do everything for them. All they do is collect the money and own everything. They don't do any work. They don't pay any bills. They don't do anything that's unpleasant. Charlie world, I understand that when, when God said that God worked six days and took a rest on the seventh day, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to work six days and be off on the seventh day. That's what God did. God did that so that we don't have to. All we got to do is take up the slack that seventh day. Work one day out of the seven day week. Take the other six days for yourself. The way it could run. It could work. Everybody just did their part. That seventh day. But you know what? Sadly, a bunch of people wouldn't even do that. They would do nothing but complain, even in such a wonderful world where they only got to work one day at a seven. They would still be unhappy. We still call off and make a mess of things. People are problematic. That's what Matt says. I think he's right about that. <laughs> I used to watch the Union Hall, and I swear, and the churches, this is something that's kind of true. Is you got a group of people, and it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. And those people are going to divide up, fight it out. If they can't find a reason, they'll just say, well, you know what, all the people on the left and all the people on the right are going to get it on. Left versus right, because we ain't got nothing else. It doesn't really matter anyway. We've got to fight about something. tell you as long as these 
fuckers lie and like they do and cheat and steal, I am going to fucking fight in my way, doing what I think will do the most good. Even if I'm all alone, all alone in the whole world, I got God, it's all I need. I'm blessed the other. Basically more than anybody I know. I know God's with me. I'm not looking for Christ to come back. Christ is already here with me. Beside me every day. I share every day with my God. We go through it together and I will try and listen. My heart, my spirit. I try and do what God wants me to do, no matter how bizarre sometimes. By going and seeing the mirror, raising a stink with the common citizens about their warmongering ways, hypocrite, cowardly ways. willing to fight myself. I don't have nobody fight for me. Not while I still can. Peace and love. Give us peace and love. God above bids us peace and love. Peace and Understand, yeah, we gotta understand. This is how we might save the world. Peace and love, give them peace and love. God above, it's us peace and love. Peace and love. As you would have them do unto you, love your friends, love your enemies too. Peace and love, give them peace and love. God below bids us peace and love. Peace and love, oh. They steal your coat, offer them your shirt too. Peace and love, give them peace and love. God below bids us peace and love. Peace and love. Oh, 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 oh. They strike your cheek, offer them the other one to trust in your God to defend you. Peace and love, give them peace and love. God below, bids us peace and love. Peace and love. Oh, Got 
understand, yeah, we gotta understand, this is how we can save the world, peace and love, give them peace and love, God above bids us peace and love, peace and love, oh, And we gotta understand, yeah, we gotta understand, this is how we might save the world. Peace and love, give them peace and love, God above bids us peace. that one up a little bit. When you wrote the song, you get to make some changes whenever you want to, you know what I mean? Everything, every day is a different day. Some days you gotta do it this way, some days you gotta do it that way. Every day is different. Every day is a fresh new chance to do the right thing. Get out there and do the right thing. People, stop war. Stop doing evil to other people. Be good. Love each other, be kind. Feed the people, house the people. Give the people a sense of hope and ownership and pride and love. A sense for doing what's right. You know what I mean? Sure you do. Of course you do. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Thank <laughs> you.